Well, hello everybody. This is Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. So the next couple of videos that I'm going to talk about will be over the uh, the concept of uh, liberation, or uh, some people, a lot of people actually, will uh, say weaning from mechanical ventilation. Um, I really prefer the term uh, liberation. Um, I really like that terminology. I, I suppose it resonates well uh, with me on, on some level, as far as is liberating the patient from the ventilator uh, versus this, this kind of this weaning. And, and I really do think that um, that is obviously the primary goal of mechanical ventilation. And not, not only do I think that, but that, that really is a primary goal, is to get a patient liberated from the ventilator, get them breathing on their own, and get them breathing uh, without um, an apparatus uh, in their airway. Now, clearly that, that won't always happen, and um, obviously there are a lot of people that may end up on long-term uh, trach hair, but still to get them to breathe as much on their own as possible should be the primary goal. So uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and just talk about uh, weaning or liberation and um, I'll probably do a couple videos on this subject, maybe even more. Uh, so let's just talk about some statistics here. And uh, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Guy, uh, who's a surgical intensivist and the director of the burn unit at Vanderbilt, does a um, series of lectures or discussions, um, and it's a free podcast you can download from iTunes. It's called Surgical ICU Rounds, uh, Dr. Jeffrey uh, Guy, and what I'll do is I'll try to put a uh, link to those podcasts uh, or link to his website. It's, it's BurnDoc, um, I believe it's BurnDoc.com. Um, but you can download all of his podcasts for free off of iTunes. He does some excellent podcasts on talking about liberating people from mechanical ventilation. So I'll try to go ahead and post a description in the link below. Okay, so introduction. Well, just over about 70%, I believe 75% of mechanically ventilated, ventilated patients can be liberated uh, without too much difficulty. This is a good thing. 10 to 15% of the patients require some sort of protocol over a 24 to 72 hour um, time period. So um, you can't initially wean them, but we can use some method, some protocol, some guideline to help get them liberated over a period of about one to th three days. Now, five to 10% uh, are gonna require a gradual weaning over a much longer period. And that period obviously can, can vary from just a, a few days to to weeks. And then about 1% of uh, patients become chronically dependent on mechanical ventilation, which is actually a rather high number if you think about it for every uh, 10, or uh, for every 100, excuse me, for every 100 people that become innovated, at least one of them will never come off the ventilator. They will never come off the ventilator uh, statistically. This is a big statistic. And um, let's just talk about things that, that we can do to help minimize that if possible. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, is the patient ready to wean? And some of the things we look at is, is if they were in respiratory failure, is there improvement? Is there an absence of major organ system failure? Am I able to appropriately oxygenate and ventilate the patient with a minimal amount of support? Um, clearly, if I am my patient on 15 of PEEP, and uh, 80% FiO2, and uh, their their PaO2 is is say um, 50, and they're satting you know 86%. They may that's probably not a, a appropriate oxygenation, not appropriately oxygenating ventilating, and they're requiring a significant amount of support from the ventilator to maintain the the oxygenation status that they have. Do they have an adequate ventilatory status? Are they able to ventilate? Um, may manage um, carbon dioxide effectively, and of course this can vary from, from person to person. Are there intact airway protective mechanisms? Does the patient cough? Do they have a good cough? Do they have a gag reflex? Are they awake? Are they responsive? Are they oriented? Are they able to manage their oral secretions? These are all very important things that we need to assess before we ever think about pulling the tube out. And then the primary thing we need to look at is the, whatever led to the intubation, the condition that led to the intubation, is that condition resolving or has it resolved? If the answer to that is no, we have no business extubating our patient at this time. <clears throat> okay, 
So adequate oxygenation status, just some statistics I'll throw out. Generally, you want your PaO2 greater than 60 with an FiO2 of 40% of or less, and you really want your PEEP at 5% or less. You also want to have a good PF ratio. Um, a lot of people say greater than 200. The higher, the better. If I meet my PF ratio is 3, 4, uh, you know, 420 even, that is a much a more of a reassuring indicator that my patient is oxygenating effectively and, of course, at a minimum amount of support, the FiO2 of 40% or less and um, lower levels of PEEP, um, preferably um, at 5 or less. Okay, ventilatory status. Well, is there an intact ventilatory drive? Can the patient regulate and control their own level of ventilation? Or when you um, take them off mandatory ventilation, do they just quit breathing? Um, and they just don't ventilate. Uh, when we look at their respiratory rate, you know, are they tachypneic? If they're significantly tachypneic, then that is a problem. That's increased work, maybe increased work of breathing, um, some sort of uh, some sort of problem with being in, in able to unable to effectively ventilate. So generally, we want an adult respiratory rate of, of 30 or less. We want a minute ventilation of less than 12 liters. If their minute ventilation is 12 liters and above. That is a significant amount of gas that's going in out of the lungs when you look at normal minute ventilation being somewhere around, what, four, four to six, maybe four to eight liters. Uh, you're looking at um, almost double what, what your normal minute ventilation is. Clearly, if, they're, they're, if, if, if they are they're ventilating um, that to that extent, 12 liters and above, there is some, some issue that we need to resolve first. Um, look at their VDVT ratio there. That's their um, dead space to tidal volume. We need that less than 60%. If 60% of their tidal volume is, is just dead space or ventilating 60% of what they're getting is being uh, ventilated as dead space, clearly we have some issues that we need to work on. And then do they have functional respiratory muscles? The diaphragm's working. The intercostal muscles are working. Are, are they using significant um, amounts of accessory muscles um, is there excessive work of breathing. So these are some of the things we need to ask. Um, intact protective airway protection, this is a really big deal um, because it, once that tube is out, if that patient can't protect their airway, of course this sets, sets them up for uh, you know, failure to oxygenate, failure to ventilate, overall respiratory failure, and aspiration. Um, you know, are they, do they have an appropriate level of consciousness? Can they cooperate? Is there an intact cough and gag reflex, functional respiratory muscles? Some physicians will even talk to the patient and ask the patient, you know, can you move your head up? They'll take the pillow away, lift your head up, lift your head down, you know, um, flex and extend your neck. And, and this may be a reassuring sign that the patient is going to be able to, we can effectively liberate the patient and the patient can control or protect their airway if need be. Um, we also want to look at the function of other organ systems, you know, optimize cardiac, um, body temperature, you know, if somebody is really febrile, every degree, um, that I increase my body temperature, um, I'm going to increase CO2 production and O2 consumption by about 5%. It's pretty significant. I want to have normal electrolytes. I want to have good potassium, magnesium, phosphorate, uh, phosphate, excuse me, um, calcium, uh, and, uh, and sodium. And, you know, of course we know that you know, electrolytes are very important for, um, cardiac function, neurological function, and even, um, you know, function of, of contractile, uh, tissue like breathing muscles, for example, the diaphragm. Uh, we want a good adequate, uh, nutritional status. Generally when, uh, when somebody goes into the ICU, we actually put them into a state of starvation. So we, we need to consult with the nursing and some of the other allied health staff and make sure that a patient is getting adequate nutritional support because if they're not getting good nutritional support, they're not going to be very strong and, and they're not going to have effective uh, breathe, uh, ability to effectively breathe. And of course, if we overfeed somebody, certainly lots of carbohydrates, we can cause increased CO2 production there. And then we just want to optimize uh, the renal system as possible, their acid-base balance, do they have any underlying metabolic issues, how's their liver, do they have any underlying GI issues. Okay, guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it off here, and um, I'll pick it up in the next video. Uh, thanks for hanging in there.